Hello and welcome to Johannesburg. It's a very cold uh, July morning where we are today uh, continuing our tradition of having these conversations, CNBC Africa, called the CNBC Conversations. My name is Godfrey Mutizwa. In this edition of the program today, I'll be joined by my colleague uh, Fifi Peters and we have the honor uh, of uh, interviewing the former Prime Minister of uh, the United Kingdom. Now, this is a man who ran uh, Britain for 10 years with an ambitious brand of socialism uh, that you saw his party being labeled uh, the New Labour. He stepped down in 2007 and is certainly one of the oldest uh, statesmen in the world. He now runs a non-profit organization called the Tony Blair African Governance Initiatives, which seeks to work with African governments to improve the lot of their people. We welcome him to the program. Mr. Blair, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Godfrey. It's a pleasure, Vivi. Hi. So I am imagining sitting where you are in the United Kingdom, watching what is, has been happening with the world with the uh, outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. You must be wondering also what happens to the initiatives that you've been running with African governments and watching your friends on the continent responding uh, to the pandemic. What have you seen so far that's good? What have you seen so far perhaps that needs a little leadling? Yeah, so this is, um, this is the biggest challenge I've ever seen for governments anywhere in the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's a global phenomenon. It's incredibly complicated. There's still lots we don't know. And um, we have actually repurposed the whole of our, our institute because the Africa Governance Initiative is now part of the, the institute that we have. Um, and all our teams who are working in Africa have really gone to working on COVID with the governments. There's about 15 different governments we work with across Africa. And essentially, I would say that Africa has got something's right. And at the moment, the number of deaths from COVID-19, just over 15,000, is a third of the number of deaths for the UK. So the, for the whole of the continent of Africa, it's a third of the number of deaths of the UK. So at one level, you could say Africa has done well. Many countries locked down fast. Um, South Africa, for example, took, took a lot of very good early action. But I think we're now at a pretty crucial moment because the cases are still rising. And the question I, I have is, is, is COVID-19 ticking up in Africa or is it taking off? And it's quite hard to know the answer to that. So the number of cases are going up quite rapidly. Um, and it's a very difficult challenge for African governments because they can't really do an economic lockdown. If, if, they, if they lock down too severely, they put at risk their economy, they put at risk the treatment of other diseases. So they're in this really difficult dilemma, which is, yes, you've got to take the measures to deal with the disease, but at the same time, you, you can't wreck your economy because if you do that, you're going to cause even more misery. The cure ends up as worse than the disease. And of course, there are many other um, illnesses that require treatment across Africa. So, and then there's all sorts of issues like food supply. So it's, it's a very difficult balance. And I think African governments, well, it's a big continent, many governments are doing different things. I would say they're doing their level best at the moment, but I think there's also some anxiety that we don't have this disease fully under control and it could take off if we're not careful. And no way have we seen this dilemma better illustrated than here in South Africa, where we have uh, what I might call one of the hardest lockdowns, if you like. I, I haven't had a drink in uh, uh, months, uh, Mr. Blair. And uh, at the same time, we also know that there are many more millions of people who are without jobs. Now, you would imagine at this particular time, at a time like this, Africa's friends would come to the fore, in particular, the international organizations. From a UN perspective, WHO perspective, have you seen the kind of support that the continent requires? Well, I think the WHO, to be fair, has done its, its, its best. Um, and also the African Union has created this African Medical Supplies platform, uh, which, which your president, President Ramaphosa, set up. And that's obviously been of enormous assistance. But no, frankly, in the international community, the absence of global coordination around this pandemic has been, to me, absolutely shocking. 
I mean, when you think, when I was in office actually 15 years ago, in this month of July, we held a G7 summit and you know, made major advances for Africa in partnership with African countries, um, you know, a massive amount of debt cancellation, uh, tripling the US and UK aid budgets. Uh, you know, you look at what's happened in this pandemic and frankly, the coordination's not been very good. Um, some measures have been taken, but we need to do far more. And we've got this huge challenge coming down the track because I think, you know, my institute's also working very carefully on all the vaccine initiatives that are happening around the world, including the one in the UK, the Oxford vaccine, that looks extremely promising. But how we're going to make sure that we manufacture these and distribute them, including to countries in Africa, is again going to be a, a huge challenge. And we'll need to do this because in the end, a vaccine is going to be the only way we're really going to get things back to normal. Mr. Blair, just to come in there, what do you think is behind the uh, lack of collaboration between the world in uh, tackling this virus, especially as you do say we're not or you're not too sure at what stage we are at yet, whether we are at the stage where the virus is picking up or taking off? Yeah, I think it's partly because obviously all country leaders want to look after their own people first, and that's that's natural. But it's also because it's you know, when I was in office, I think there was a real sense you had to try and come together around global problems. I think there's less of a sense there now, partly for reasons to do with America. And then in the UK, obviously, we've left the European Union. So that gives us a more difficult <clears throat> position trying to coordinate that from a European perspective. So there are many reasons for it. But, but the problem is that it does hinder our ability to tackle the disease effectively. So let me give you one very clear example. In my view, the, the absent a vaccine, and even with the best will in the world, and, and, and if some of these vaccines turn out to be successful, it's still gonna be several months before they're in <clears throat> anything like mass circulation and probably you know, reasonably well into next year. So the only bridge between now and then is testing, but testing, a, which doesn't require lab facilities, but is on the spot rapid testing. Now, the, there are a whole lot of initiatives going on around the world, but if there was proper global coordination, frankly, four or five months ago, we should have been globally coordinating the acceleration of the innovations that will lead to reliable on the spot testing. Because just imagine if you had the capability of, of having a rapid antigen and antibody test, i.e. a test to see whether you've got the disease, a test to see whether you have the disease, have had it. Um, supposing you had that capability, getting the results on the spot within two or three minutes, it would be transformative for countries' economies. Because then, for example, you can make sure that everyone before they go on an aeroplane gets a test, people before they go into work have a test. Um, you could have a disease status, people can actually have their own bio ID. So you could say, well, look, I've had a test and therefore it makes it easier to open up restaurants and bars. You know, this, this is the type of thing that it will come, I think, in time. But, you know, we should have been far quicker doing this because it's, it is a global pandemic and every country faces the same problems. Mm -hmm. And just to build on that, Mr. Blair, in terms of perhaps increasing the testing cap uh, capability, you did mention that you are advising a number of uh, countries here on the continent on ways to better contain uh, COVID-19. Which are those countries and what are you telling them in their pursuit to contain the virus without uh, destroying their economies any further? Well, as I say, it's about 15 different countries um, throughout the continent uh, without listing them all. But um, what we're trying to do is, is to give people practical things and ways of, of containing the disease without locking your economy down. So for example, you've got to protect the frontline workers. You've got to have adequate testing capacity at your borders. You've got to be able to do a certain amount of social distancing for the, for the vulnerable groups. Because one thing, if you look at the figures in, in Africa, at the present time, the fatality rate does seem to be lower. There could be a greater resilience in the African population. It's obviously a younger population. Um, and 
you know, there are certain measures that you can take that will at least help you to contain it. But the testing, it, it's a really difficult, I mean, South Africa, for example, has done actually a very good job on testing and has had a, you know, you've done more tests um, per population than I think any other country in Africa by a long way. So the point is this though, if you were, if you were able to do rapid testing, that would give you the ability to, to have a much clearer idea of who has the disease, where it's spreading. It would allow you, for example, to alert your healthcare system if there were hot spots, and how you manage those hot spots is really important, how you build the local community to be able to deal with those situations. Sometimes, for example, if you're if you're in an area where it's let's say it's a poor area, people living together, it's very hard to do social distancing unless you have the local community on board and you're able to identify who are the most vulnerable groups. So what we've been doing, and we just published a, another paper from the Institute earlier this week, is say to governments, look, we actually do a checklist of 12 different things. Here are things, even without locking down, you can do that will make a difference. But of course, all of this would be much, much easier if you had that testing capability. And the biggest risk, by the way, for many African countries, and this is true actually for developing countries outside of Africa, is if they think it's just impossible to deal with this disease, in, in a way their incentive is to test less because the more you test, the more you find out. And that can be very troubling. And you've really got to be in a situation where you do at least know what the spread of the disease has been in, in your communities, because otherwise the risk is if African countries don't have a real handle on their disease, then when the rest of the world opens up, it's going to be harder for countries to join the international community and, and have the exchanges and the travel that they require. I want to follow up, uh, Mr. Blair, on your comment about uh, locking down economies without destroying them. And I'm not interested here in any way in uh, uh, having uh, you uh, criticize uh, the president of South Africa for one of the harshest lockdown that we have seen uh, since this pandemic broke. Uh, I'm more interested in uh, perhaps the alternatives and the options available to governments in this very difficult time. Because we have seen here uh, in South Africa, as I was saying, uh, we know uh, tobacco has been banned. We know that alcohol sales have been banned. We also know that there's a curfew. And when you look around the world, you do not see all of those measures in tandem. Is that the best way of going about this? You are friends with Mr. Ramaphosa. Frankly, as a friend, what would you say to him? Well, it's really, first of all, let me explain the dilemma that, that, that he has. I mean, if you look at the countries that have succeeded in getting on top of this, um, Germany, South Korea, and then you have smaller countries like uh, Greece, um, you know, if you, if you look at those countries and what they did, they did do a very severe lockdown at the very beginning. So when, when your president did the lockdown, he was following what certainly in Europe has been seen as best practice. The problem is you will have elements of your economy that obviously are very different um, from a Western economy. And the severity of the lockdown then causes you know, enormous distress. So I think you know, it's really a question of trying to balance the different factors and get to a situation where you you aren't spreading the disease so that it runs out of control, because if it does, by the way, I mean, your, your death level could be very, very high. So I think what your president's trying to do at the moment is to be in a position where he takes measures that are sufficiently severe to curtail the spread of the disease and then give himself the time to be able to build up the capacity within the healthcare system and also to be in a position that when these, these innovations come on stream, whether testing or vaccines, then you haven't been so hard hit that you're, you know, you, you've ended up with a, a, a death toll that could be, you know, that could be very, very severe for the country. So look, it's, it's extremely difficult. All, all I know is that when you look at best practice around the world, you've got to try and take those, those, that balance between lockdown to stop spreading and not 
damaging your economy over much. You've got in each set of circumstances to try and fashion your own strategy that works. And the only thing that I would say is that I think if it's possible to get testing done in a way that allows you to start discriminating between different parts of the country, different occupations, different types of people who will be vulnerable or not vulnerable, that is the best thing that you can do. But really, Godfrey, I've got to say to you, I, am, I would not like to be having to take these decisions in government now. They're incredibly difficult. And I think they're most difficult for leaders of countries with economies like South Africa. And, uh, you know, even the testing that you talk about, we haven't done as well as we ought to because we were looking uh, with a colleague uh, the other day on the numbers of testing here in uh, South Africa versus the United Kingdom, almost similar population sizes, if you like. And uh, we are, I think, around 2 million in the UK. It's more than 15 or thereabouts, if not more. So <laughs> there's a lot of work that we need to do. I wanted to go back to the issue of global coordination uh, because you did mention that uh, perhaps you haven't seen the kind of coordination that ought to have been happening. And in part, I guess we can attribute that to uh, the rift and the war on trade, at least between the US and China. Now, my question is, what does Africa do in that kind of a world? Because here we are, uh, caught in between with a, a raging uh, pandemic, if you like, and we have got uh, 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 the key sides of the world who should have been helping us, not being in a, in, in a position to help us because they are involved in their own little quarrel. Have we seen the leadership that we require from the African Union, in your view? I think Africa's done its best to navigate this, but your, your point you're making is completely right, Godfrey. I mean, it's a, yes, it's been a huge complicating factor because at the time that you've had the pandemic, global pandemic, therefore global coordination is necessary, you've had the two biggest powers in the world um, move increasingly in, into a position of hostility and confrontation. Now, what, what I try to say people, to people about the America-China relationship, and indeed the, the, the Western China, is yes, there are serious issues um, that the West has at the moment with certain of the actions of the Chinese leadership. But at the same time, you know, on, on COVID-19, it's important we do try and coordinate with China. And I think the Africa Union has actually been quite smart in, in, in making sure that it, it keeps its lines of communication open to China and strong. Uh, and your president's actually been very active on that, to be fair. Um, and of course, a lot of the um, protective equipment and other things that you require come out of China. And China has also, by the way, got one of the most, or two or three of the most promising vaccines. So you've had to do that at the same time as not alienating the United States. And by and large, I think, the African relationship, AU relationship with the US is pretty good. But yes, it's a complicating factor. Um, and every country around the world today is having now to devote a special amount of attention to how do I manage this, our relationship with two countries, both of which we want to keep on good terms with, who have now fallen out in quite a severe way. And you know, what I will say to people about the this issue, you know, are we moving into a new Cold War with China? Is the Cold War analogy, in my view, is completely false. Uh, first of all, you know, the Soviet Union, in the end, was a collection of countries that ultimately didn't want to be together. Um, China is one country and, you know, very proudly nationalistic. Secondly, China is the largest population country in the world. Um, and third, and most important of all, it's a major economic power. When the Berlin Wall fell in the early 1990s, the total amount of American imports from the whole of the Soviet Union was roughly $200 million. In 2018, their imports from China were $556 billion. So you, know, you can go figure it out. There's no way I think the world can afford to go into a Cold War with China. So we're going to have to we, we did a paper on this recently, say, look, there are going to be areas of confrontation. There will be areas of competition, certainly around technology, but you've got to reserve a space for cooperation. And it's in that space for cooperation that I think Africa will want to play. 
And Mr. Blair, you have been quoted as saying that COVID-19 has given the world, um, in essence, an opportunity to review the global architecture of governance and ask if it is fit for purpose. I'd like to put that question back to you and ask um, if it is indeed fit for purpose for this new world, this new normal that the virus is ushering us all into. So it's, it's clearly not, but the, the question always, if you're, if you're in the practical world of politics is, okay, that's fine, but what do you do about it? I mean, I think you've got to divide this into two parts. With, with the WHO, I think it's clear that it's going to be, have to be, you know, renewed and revived and, and, and able to handle something of this scale. I mean, I'm not one of those people who criticize the WHO. I think they've done their level best through the crisis, but you know, the fact is the scale of the pandemic is is vast. So I can see how you could you could come to an agreement around that type of specific part of global governance. But then you've got other issues to do with global governance that are much more difficult. I mean, ever since I've been in politics, people have talked about reforming the UN Security Council. Um, and it's just been impossible to do. You've got the G7, you've got the G20, the G20 today is a more natural body for global governance because it includes um, the major powers like India and China uh, and indeed countries like South Africa that aren't in the, the G7. But I think, you know, again, I'm not sure how much we're going to be able to imbue something like the G20 with the governance structures it requires. I think it's worth trying, but I, it's difficult. But what I do think is that regional blocks like the Africa Union will become increasingly important. And that's where, for example, your Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement um, that's been agreed, um, I think, last year, that is incredibly important. Um, you know, if you look at the African economy that's developing at the future with a, a population that will double in the next 30 years, you know, breaking down, for example, internal trade barriers between African countries. Trade within Europe is uh, around 70% um, of, of, of the trade. Within Africa, it's 15%. So you just think of the enormous benefits of really making that continental free trade agreement work. If you look at the technology sector in Africa today, it's really coming on a pace. Um, and you know, that again is something where Africa's utilization of technology could, in my view, be absolutely transformative. It's one of the reasons why I think it's really important when you do get a vaccine, for example, that we have a proper register of those people who are vaccinated and use that to build a proper database for healthcare systems within Africa. So I think there's a, there's a massive amount that can do at a regional level, but Fifi, to be frank, I think there's going to be a limit as to what we can do at a global level, unless you get really imaginative leadership at the top of uh, the international community. And, you know, it's hard to see that happening, especially with this America-China confrontation. Uh, staying with the uh, topic of uh, free trade and uh, un or uniting the, the African continent in terms of trade, I'd like to know uh, your, your lessons perhaps that the uh, continent can take from your part of the world where we are seeing an unwrangling or untangling of that trading block. I do understand that one of the issues that did give rise to, to, to Brexit and the conversations that are being had in Europe right now was the issue around immigration and uh, Britons uh, feeling that foreign nationals were coming in to take their jobs. Uh, this is uh, some of the things that we have been experiencing here in South Africa, as you may be aware, with uh, foreign nationals um, also uh, suffering violence at one stage as a result of South Africans feeling that um, they were doing the same. So now this is an ingredient that we are, or a, a factor we are grappling with, and this is before uh, the free trade area has actually even taken off um, in its uh, totality. So just on the lessons that uh, the continent uh, can take from uh, Britain and the European Union experience in formulating its own regional trading bloc? Yeah, so it's, it's certainly worth studying. Um, look, the European single market, uh, which Britain now is no longer a member of, um, unfortunately, in my view, because I think Britain 
you know, half of our trade is with Europe and it's going to be very tough for us when we finally end the transition period and actually leave the single market of Europe. But if you go back over the past years, in the last 30 years or so, you know, the trade within Europe has brought enormous benefits, um, huge increases in prosperity. The, the difficulty is that we, we, as part of this, we have had the free movement of people. Now, I think, again, if you look on the whole at the free movement of people, it's been, again, of benefit, because um, it means that people are, are allowed to work across national frontiers. But I have to accept that immigration today is a, a very, very fiercely contested issue. And in my view, um, it would have been possible to have adjusted the European free movement system. I think it will eventually be adjusted so that you can deal with some of the problems. For example, when you get large influxes of people and then you get job displacement amongst the uh, local population. I think you could have dealt with that without Britain leaving the European Union. Um, but I think, you know, whether it's in South Africa or anywhere else in the world, the most important thing about immigration is immigration properly controlled can bring enormous benefits. If you look at some of the greatest companies that have been started in the United States of America or indeed in the UK, they've been started by immigrants. So immigration properly controlled can bring enormous energy and benefit to a country. But it's a problem if your borders become porous, you don't know who's coming in, you can't get a handle on, on um, you know, the numbers, and that's a problem. Now, I came to the conclusion when I was prime minister, and I tried to do this at the time, that uh, there was too much opposition, and I think we will come back to it eventually. I actually think with technology today, you can have a very simple biometric identity system, which where people's privacy can be completely protected, and that allows you to know who's got a right to be in your country and who hasn't. And the important thing, I think, about immigration, what I learned over a long period of time in politics, is if you don't have rules, you have prejudices. So if you want to avoid the prejudices, you've got to have rules. But what you can't have is sort of uncontrolled migration into your country because it upsets people. Uh, they see their communities change around them. And then you end up with people feeling anti-immigrant, which is really not a sensible feeling to have in today's world. I have to say, Prime Minister, I've never been able to reconcile how a country that grew uh, so much because of its ability to reach every part of the world became so insular as to then say, ah, ah, we don't want to be mixing up with people from coming from other parts of the world. But, but that's not my question. I'm coming back and talking a little bit more uh, about Africa. And I'm asking the question, you are quoted as saying that uh, uh, what this pandemic is doing is to exacerbate uh, fissures and tensions uh, and one of those tensions certainly has been around governance. And when you look around the African continent, we have seen some kind of play by some governments to use the pandemic as a tool to suppress opposition. So I'm asking the question, are you having quiet conversations with some of your friends, leaders, and some who may not be, uh, you know, your big friends to say, this actually is a time, an opportunity to reset your governance system so that you emerge on the other side as a united people. I mention, of course, this in the light of what we're seeing uh, in Zimbabwe. Yes, I mean, this is exactly the conversation I have. Look, the reason we, I started this governance initiative and the reason we, we work with governments in Africa and actually in different parts of the world is very simple because it's, it comes out of what I learned in government even in a developed nation. The single biggest determinant of success today in the world, where technology is mobile and capital is mobile, the single biggest determinant is the quality of governance. And you can take two countries living side by side, same potential, same resources, roughly same population, one succeeds, one fails. And the reason is the quality of governance which isn't just, by the way, about democracy and human rights and so on. It's also about effectiveness. It's about the ability to deliver. It's about building capable institutions. So you can take, for example, in South America, Colombia and Venezuela. One's, one's relatively successful, one's a complete basket case. You could go to Europe and look at Poland, now part of the European Union, or Ukraine, and see the difference. Or you could come to Africa and look at Rwanda and Burundi, for example. Or you could go 
to the biggest experiment in human governance that human history has seen in recent times, which is the Korean Peninsula, North Korea and South Korea. Remember, South Korea back in the 1960s had a GDP per head roughly the same size as Sierra Leone. Look at South Korea today. Now, if you look at those countries that have succeeded, it's all to do with the effectiveness of their government. So yes, what I've been saying to the presidents I work with is use this COVID crisis to accelerate the necessary changes. So changes around weeding out corruption, bringing in the rule of law, making sure you have capable um, ministries that can actually deliver for your people, um, welcome in direct investment, embracing new technology, making the reforms within your system that allow you to, to increase the prosperity of your people and govern more effectively. And this COVID-19 crisis has, of course, exposed many of the problems in the healthcare systems in Africa. Now, we knew those problems were there already, but what it's done is given urgency to accelerating the process of change. And from a UK perspective, you are working in your private capacity. From a government perspective, especially in the light of Brexit, is there perhaps more that the UK could be doing to uh, uh, strengthen and deepen its relationships with the African continent? I'm talking, of course, everything from uh, trade to cultural exchanges and uh, 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 democracy. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, it should do. Um, I mean, we have a very large aid budget. I mean, the UK is actually, this decision was taken under my government, but we're the only large Western country that devotes 0.7% of the UN um, target of its GDP um, to uh, aid. We have a very, very substantial, therefore very substantial budget. We have through the Department of International Development links all over Africa. We've got long-standing relationships. Yeah, we should be absolutely doing everything we can to promote not just trade with Africa, um, but to encourage that institution and capacity building. And look, in, in the end, by the way, um, I'm, I'm optimistic about Africa for the future, because I think there, there, there is a recognition um, across the continent that its problems have to be dealt with, that the destiny of Africa lies in its own hands. And there is a whole new generation of people coming through. I think they're not all in positions of leadership yet. But, you know, when I meet young people either in civic society or in, in, in business and local community organizations uh, on the continent of Africa, I, I have a sense of optimism about the future. But, but we've got to realize this crisis is going to do serious damage to our economies. Um, and therefore, all the things that were necessary before COVID are still necessary, but even more so. So let's get on with it. Uh, certainly. And just picking up on Godfrey's uh, question regarding uh, the opportunity for countries to press the reset uh, button in which, in which he um, highlighted Zimbabwe, I'm actually quite interested in your uh, current relations with Zimbabwe. Your relationship with the uh, former leader was well documented. Everyone saw um, it was an uh, acrimonious one, if uh, you will. And uh, you had called often for regime change to be uh, conducted in Zimbabwe and proper reform form to be followed through. Uh, what is your current relationship within your individual capacity with the uh, new administration there under President Mnangagwa's leadership? Yeah, so, so uh, when you say it was acrimonious, uh, President Mugabe, that might qualify as a British understatement. Yeah, it was. Um, look, I, I, Zimbabwe, I hope the, the, the new leadership there, I mean, I I hope very much it, it will take the necessary measures and reforms because Zimbabwe is a it, it, it is potentially a very wealthy country, and you know its people are you know I meet Zimbabweans around the world. I mean they're talented people, so you know I, I really do I wish the government to succeed. I think it's important that the government does succeed, and I think the new leadership, uh, you know I. I I think in at least some of the statements they're making, they, they show signs of wanting to, to do those changes. But it really is, you know, in the end, there's no, I don't think there's a great mystery about what has to be done. And I, I don't want to be in the position of, of, of lecturing the president or the government, because frankly, it wouldn't be very welcome. But I do think, you know, it's not, it's not a mystery as to what needs to happen there. 
And it's not just about opening up the political space. I think the most important thing that's got to happen is, is really to take the economic reforms that are going to allow that massive latent potential in the country um, to, to, to boom, because it, it, it could do. And it's, I think if, if the government there showed real commitment to reform, then even people like myself who have been extremely critical of the government in the past would be very willing and open to, to helping for the future. Because, you know, we need Zimbabwe back as a serious player, both in Africa and in the international community. Has President Mnangagwa sought your counsel at all at any point? Do you have any conversations? Um, no, I've not met him or spoken to him myself. Um, you know, but I'd be perfectly happy to, to have an interaction if it, if it was helpful. But I, I think, you know, these things are probably best done in a, in a, in a, in a private way. But it, it, just so that I'm clear about it, it's, I was, I mean, I, it's a long history as to how we got into this situation with sure. um, Zimbabwe. And I, I actually think at certain points there were misunderstandings and not just genuine disagreements. Mm. But, you know, for me, Zimbabwe, if it could get its, you know, act together and move forward, it would be a very, very exciting place to, to, to go to and to work with. Would you be open to perhaps playing an intermediary role? I think it's going to be difficult for me to do that because of all the history. But, you know, basically, I always say to the, the people I work with in Africa, the thing about my governance initiative is it's a not-for-profit. We're not interested in anything other than helping you. I have had a long-standing commitment to Africa, both in government and out of it. And it's because I think if Africa is a continent, takes its rightful place in the world, the world will be safer and better. And I say that because, you know, you only have to look at the world today and you see two things that emerge very clearly. The first is that we are moving to a situation where there are really effectively two superpowers as countries, um, America and China. You may get to a situation but I don't think we're at it yet, where the European Union, as it were, sits at that top table because of its abilities. I know it sits in many of the four of the international community, but Europe's still got a, a way to go before it has the, the collective heft used in the right way to be really um, playing at the same level. And then the question is, will India join and will Africa join? Now, Africa is a continent, not a country, but... Africa is going to be um, the most populous continent in the world. It's got the potential to develop very fast, I think particularly if it embraces the technology revolution and really drives that through its systems because it can then leapfrog a lot of the legacy systems of the West. But we need Africa to be there. And so, you know, for me, I think the, the important thing is, is to be able to make those changes in governance that allow Africa to bring the best lessons from around the world as to what works and what doesn't and apply them in an African context and in an African way. And Mr. Blair, you have said that um, a challenge that Africa is facing is its, its urgent need to move uh, beyond aid because it's in doing so that it will actually be able to rise to its potential and, you know, take the continent into its own hands. But um, I would argue that uh, one of the ways in which it could successfully do this is by also relooking its terms of trade with its international partners such that it gets more bang for the uh, commodities underground, um, the hard commodities like like uh, gold and the soft, like cocoa. So in, 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 in Africa rising and reaching its potential, practically, how does it do that without upsetting international partners too much, given that you know the status quo of minerals uh, being uh, mined here in Africa, but being beneficiated outside and then being imported back at a premium has been around for so long? Yeah, that's a really good point. But the, the key is, is to get value added into Africa. So, for example, in agriculture, to have 
agro-processing so that you, you're, you're actually adding the value in Africa and therefore getting the benefit, um, the true benefit of the commodities value. So, for example, we work on these issues in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire at the moment. And here's my, my, my take on it, because this is a difficult argument to have. And I'm just telling you what I see as the best lessons from around the world when other countries have done this. You know, sometimes people think that it's it sort of undermines your sense of national pride if you import intellectual capital and management capital. But I honestly think that the best way for countries to develop fast is to be prepared to get that investment in, but in the value added sectors, and then you build your own capability and in time, you're then able to build a, a capacity to export your intellectual capital. But when you're first beginning, you know, you need that coming in. And, and you know, the best way to do this is to make Africa a really attractive place for, for investment, number one, and number two, to build the infrastructure necessary to support it. But there again, governance is really important. And, you know, you will get the investment in if you have the right environment for investment. Um, and that, again, you know, what that means is pretty easy to identify. Doing it is often hard, but yeah. that needs to be done. And then one of the things I specifically look at my governance initiative is how do we build the infrastructure? Um, how do we get the investment in to build that? How do we get the international financial institutions to coordinate in the right way so that you're building what you need, particularly in areas like um, electricity and power, that you need ports, you need um, road and rail, you know, these are the absolutely vital things for the future. And, you know, Africa can do it, but it, it's, it's really, the West, I think, I don't think there's a problem with Western companies and countries wanting to come and invest in Africa if we create the right circumstances for them to do it. On, on the contrary, one of the things and I often say this to the heads of government I work with, yeah. is you have to understand the huge opportunity Africa has at the moment. Indeed, any developing country has. There are vast pools of capital in the West because interest rates are very low. I mean, they're almost yeah. negative in certain parts of the world. Those pools of capital are looking for an outlet. Sure. You've got pension funds in the West. You've got, for example, or the Japanese, take the Japanese main pension fund. It is over a trillion dollars in it, right? They can't get their returns with not with usual investments in the West. We've got to make Africa really investable for those yeah. pools of capital. Absolutely, absolutely. And therein lies the challenge, without doubt. Will Africans be able to adopt a technology and uh, uh, the other things that are required to make it work while at the same time allowing governance to flourish? We don't know. Maybe the future does know that. Mr. Blair, thank you very much uh, for your time, sir. It's been a real pleasure chatting to you and uh, tapping your insights on uh, where we need to go as Africans to make sure we take advantage of this pandemic and go forward. Fifi, as always, uh, thank you very much. You've been watching this. CNBC Conversation. Thank you for joining us.